Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Unit 5 Review. Uh, unit 5 is going to be on genetics. And before we get too far into genetics, you should have had a good understanding of size. In other words, I've taken these five terms over here, and you should be able to put them in order from the largest to the smallest. And if you can't put those in order from largest to smallest, you may want to pause the video and go figure it out. Because the genome is going to be all the genetic information in us, and the smallest of these is going to be the nucleotide. And if you can't figure out what's what, what's a gene, what's DNA, what is that, um, you're going to struggle with a lot of this. And so first thing you want to do is kind of get a map and figure out where you are. But if you're back and you understand all of those things, let's get started. So basically, let's start with DNA and RNA. Um, both of them are nucleic acids, and the building blocks of nucleic acids are going to be nucleotides. And so if we were to draw out on here the parts of a nucleotide, there are basically three parts. You're going to have a sugar, so that'd be the sugar right there. You're going to have a phosphate group, and then finally you're going to have a nitrogenous base. And so one nucleotide would be that chemically. Uh, this would be another nucleotide, and this would be another nucleotide, and then there'd be a fourth nucleotide up on the top. And so um, the backbone, so we're going to refer to the backbone as everything to the left of this line. So this over here is going to be the backbone is relatively boring. It's simply a phosphate group attached to a sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. It repeats over and over and over again. And so the spice of life is going to be found in these bases, these nitrogenous bases that go to the inside. Now you should be looking at here and figuring out, well, is this DNA? Is this RNA? Well, since this has a uracil in it, then this is going to be RNA uh, on the side. Um, Another thing, since we're talking about nucleic acids, is we should discriminate between DNA and RNA. And so RNA is going to be a single strand. DNA is going to have two strands. RNA is going to contain the nitrogenous base uracil. And in DNA, that's replaced with thymine. And then the third thing is going to be in the sugar. In RNA, we're going to have a ribose sugar. So this would be the ribose sugar. And in DNA, we're going to be deoxyribose. So those are the difference. And so what do we got over here? This is a single strand of RNA. This would be RNA to DNA. One other thing we should talk about uh, before we get too far into this podcast is all the different types of RNA. There's really only one type of DNA. But RNA, we have messenger RNA. That's going to carry the message out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. We'll have the tRNA. That's going to bring the amino acids as we're doing translation. And the last one that's sometimes overlooked is the R, uh, ribosomal RNA. I'm missing probably some other ones like uh, microRNA would be another one. But these are the big ones that we're going to talk about in this podcast. One other thing before I get ahead of myself, if we look way down here at this sugar, the carbon, so this right here would be the one prime carbon, this right here would be the two prime, and then this would be the three prime carbon right there. And so this RNA is going to run from the three prime up to the five prime end. And so there's a direction in which RNA runs. And so if we have a five prime at this side of the RNA, then we're going to have a three prime end at the other side. If we're looking at the DNA, we could have, on this side, we could have a three prime end. That means, let me try to follow this correctly, way down here at the other strand, we're going to have a five prime end. But on the other side, it's going to go from three prime to five prime. And so DNA is what's called anti-parallel. It runs in opposite directions. It's parallel with the nitrogenous bases on the inside, but it's running in opposite directions, which will become important on the next slide. So let's do that. DNA replication. Before we talk about the mechanics of DNA replication, we should talk about when this actually occurs. And so if we look at a cell, so let's say we have a typical cell right here. If we want to make a duplicate of that cell, then we're going to use the process of cell division mitosis. So the cell is going to go through interphase, and it's eventually going to go through mitosis cell cytokinesis, and then we're going to have two cells. If we look at this interphase, the interphase is broken into three parts. We have the G1 phase where the cell is going to grow. It's, it's, G actually stands for gap. We've got the S phase where we're going to copy the DNA. And finally, we have the G2 phase where it's going to continue to grow again. It then divides in half. And so some cells will never make copies of themselves. So like neurons, for example, uh, they don't make a copy of themselves. So they'll never go through this cell cycle. But most cells do. And when you go through that cell cycle, you have to make sure that you're copying the DNA perfectly over. And so to do that, we use a process called DNA replication. What does it look like? Well, DNA is essentially like a zipper. And if we can unwind the zipper and add new letters uh, in the middle, then we've copied our DNA. So if we look at this up here, it seems like a mess, but it's really not that confusing. First of all, we have to unzip it. To do that, we're going to use something called helicase. Helicase will 
unzip the double helix. We've got these binding proteins that hold it in shape, but the big show is gonna be this thing right here. It's called DNA polymerase. So what's DNA polymerase gonna do? It's gonna add new letters. It's gonna add new letters only on the three prime end. So it's only gonna add letters on that three prime end of the DNA on this strand, that is. Um, if we look at the other strand, well, there is no three prime end available here. So as this unzips and as this helicase moves in that direction, we can't simply add letters here. So remember, DNA polymerase here has to go in these little fragments backwards. And so we create what are called Okazaki fragments, and then ligase comes along and then it smooths that out. So it seems pretty complex, but it's really not that bad. Uh, the only thing I forgot is we have to put primer down first, a little bit of RNA before we can actually add that DNA. So it seems like a mess, but it's incredibly efficient. We're really good at copying our DNA. And so each cell in your body has identical DNA. And you can thank DNA replication for that. Okay, let's go to the next slide then. Actually, let me go back. <laughs> so when does, what does this look like if you're having a hard time kind of picturing this? Um, well, let's draw a, a chromosome for a second. So if this is a chromosome, so I'm gonna have the centromere right here. If this is a chromosome like that, now normally it doesn't look that way because it's gonna be loose. It's not really gonna coalesce until we get into prophase, but we sometimes just represent it that way. So if this is a chromosome, these would be the genes that are found on the chromosome. So basically what we have to do during this S phase is we have to copy that. And so basically through, through DNA replication, we're gonna make an exact copy of that chromosome and it's eventually gonna look like that. So when you think of chromosomes, you might think of this characteristic X kind of a shape. Um, what really has happened is through DNA replication, we've made an exact copy of that. And those two things are gonna be called sister chromatids. They're exactly the same. And that'll be important, especially when you get into mitosis and meiosis, ran out of room. Okay, um, if we get to transcription and translation, what is the function of transcription and translation? Well, we've made sure that the DNA is copied from cell to cell to cell, but that's not what DNA does. DNA, for the most part, is controlling what's going on in the cell, and it does that by expressing proteins, um, by um, transcribing genes or not. And so transcription and translation is that process by which we can go from uh, DNA and the message in the DNA to a protein. So I'm going to draw this as the nucleus. So the nucleus is on the top of this uh, page and then down here is going to be the cytoplasm. And so basically what happens is the DNA is going to unzip. Remember the DNA is safe in the nucleus and so it needs a messenger to get its uh, job out. And so basically the DNA will unzip. RNA polymerase is going to race down that DNA and it's going to make messenger RNA. So messenger RNA is going to look like that. Now, that's not the only thing. We have to add a cap on one side and we add a poly A tail on the other side. The other thing that we do is we have to actually get rid of those in, um, introns and so we'll splice out the introns sections of that. We'll get rid of the introns and then we'll splice the exons together. But basically when we've done all of that, so we're going to connect this together, now we have messenger RNA that's willing and ready to go out into the cytoplasm and actually do something. So here's that messenger RNA. It's gonna feed through that ribosome. And basically it has the message on how to make a protein. Every three letters, so every three letters inside the messenger RNA, and therefore every three letters inside the DNA is what's called a, a codon. And so basically that's gonna code for one amino acid. And remember the building blocks of um, proteins are gonna be these amino acids right here. So basically, messenger RNA sits within the ribosomal uh, RNA and the ribosome itself. Then tRNA is gonna arrive, it's gonna bring one amino acid with it, it'll attach that onto this chain and it'll keep going over and over and over again. Once the tRNA leaves, it's gonna go grab another amino acid and then it's gonna come in the other side. And so this is called the central dogma of life. It's the secret of life. It's how we go from the DNA and the message found there to actually usable things like protein. So the color of your skin, the color of your eyes is proteins and that's expressed in the DNA itself. Now let's get to mitosis and meiosis. So mitosis, when do we need mitosis? Well, we have a tendency to just think of mitosis as making an exact copy of a cell. Um, that's kind of simplifying it. What mitosis is, is simply division of the nucleus. So making sure that the chromosomes go equally to each nuclei. Um, but mitosis is gonna be found everywhere. So when a cell makes a copy of itself, when you went from that first zygote to the billions and trillions of cells that are inside you today, you can thank uh, mitosis for that. 
A couple of other terms that have been confusing in here are diploid and then haploid. A cell that's diploid has two complete sets of genetic material. And so this is the most simple diploid cell that I could possibly draw. So 2n, and that just stands for diploid, in this case equals 2. In other words, there are two chromosomes. We call those homologous chromosomes because you get one from your dad and you get one from your mom. Now you have 46 pair of chromosomes. So in a human, 2n equals 46. But in this diagram right here, 2n is simply going to equal uh, two. So what happens next? Well, during the S phase, remember, we'll copy it. So here are those sister chromatids we were talking about just a second ago. You'll notice that those two homologous chromosomes don't come together. This looks like metaphase here, and this would be anaphase. But eventually, when we're done, uh, we have two brand new nuclei. They're exactly the same as that original nuclei. And that's the goal of mitosis. If you reproduce asexually, you're going to make cells uh, and a new organism through that. Let's go to meiosis then. Meiosis, what's the function of that? Well, meiosis is to make only one type of cell, and that's going to be a gamete, or that's going to be a sex cell. And so in males, each of these four nuclei are going to become sperm. And in females, one will become an egg, and the other genetic material is not really utilized. And so now let's look at this cell. So now that you know what a diploid cell looks like, in this case, 2n equals, well, 1, 2, 3, 4. There's actually four here. And so we could say this is chromosome 1 from mom, 1 from dad, 2 from mom, 2 from dad. So in order to show the crossing over in meiosis, I had to make my cell a little bit more complex. But basically what happens is that we're going to copy our uh, sister chromatids. We're going to use DNA replication to make copies of it. And in this process right here, we're going to do what's called crossing over. So these will wrap around each other, remember, and they swap bits of their genetic information. They'll also line up along that metaphase plate using what's called independent assortment. And so what we're eventually going to get is gametes, where n equals 2 now. And each of those, if you look at all four of them, are going to be brand new. And so the function of meiosis is to make sex cells, to make gametes, and to make sure that each of those gametes are unique. Because remember, variation and variety is the spice of life. All right. Uh, next, I want to finish up with kind of talking about basics of genetics. And so um, all of the basics that we understand about genetics goes back to this guy right here. This is Gregor Mendel um, and this famous cross he had with purple flowers and white flowers. And so basically what he did is he had a parental class. class. And so parental group is going to be P generation. Um, in this one, he crossed purple flowers that are homozygous or true breeding for that with those that are white. And so they're homozygous recessive or true breeding for that. In the F1 generation, what he found is that they were all purple. And all their heterozygous, but since purple's dominant, they all ended up being purple. If we would have stopped there, we wouldn't have learned anything. So now we go to the F2 generation. What did he find in that? Well, we could use a Punnett square to represent that. Essentially, these would be the gametes. Sorry, you can't see that. The gametes of one parent. These would be the gametes of the other. And so the Punnett square is going to show fertilization. It's going to show what could happen um, with all the possibilities of fertilization. So we're going to do that on the inside of the Punnett square. So what do you find? If you count it out, what you'll find is you'll find one big P, big P, to every two big P, little P, to every one little P, little P. In other words, the genotypic ratio, the genes that they have, would be a one to two to one. The phenotypic ratio would be that three purple to one white. And this was amazing. They didn't understand how this white could come back as white as it ever was. And that's the importance of, of Mendel. He showed that each cell is going to have two genes. Each organism is going to have two copies of the genes, but you only get to give one of those genes to your offspring. And so we really haven't learned much ever since the time of Mendel. We had to tweak it a little bit with the discovery of the chromosome, but we haven't learned much. Um, so basically, how does this work? Well, you could use a Punnett square like this to do simple problems, but an important thing to know is the rule of multiplication. And so if you ever get a problem where they're asking you, um, and they use the word and in it, they generally can solve that using multiplication. So what are the odds of having a boy and a boy and a boy? Well, it'd be one half times one half times one half, or a one in eight probability. You could say, what about uh, or, then we use addition. Let's say I were to ask you, what are the odds of having a boy or a girl? Well, there'd be a one-half probability of the boy, one-half on the girl, and so the odds would be uh, one. <laughs> so you're going to have a boy or a girl. Um, so if you can learn these and know how to use a simple um, Punnett square, you're going to go really far in genetics. So I've got some problems over here. So basically what you need to do is work these out. So this would be one parent. 
this would be the other parent, what's the probability that we get that? Or this parent there, that parent, what's the probability we get that? Or this parent, that parent, what's the probability we get that? To do that, you should pause the video, try and work it out, but I'm gonna show you how to do it. So we could do a simple Punnett square for this one, so that'd be a one and two probability. Um, if we do the next one, you do it letter by letter. So if we do the P's first with that and that, there's a one and two probability. If you don't believe me, if you think it's one and four, do the Punnett square. With this P's and these P's that you'd get that, it's a one and two probability. What about the Y's? Well, with those two Y's, it's a one and two probability that you'd have this for an offspring. And so the whole thing, since we had to have both of those, it'd be one and four. If we go down to this big one down here at the bottom, what are the odds on the P's? Well, that'd be a one and four. What about the Y's? That would be a one in two and a one in two. And so the answer would be a one in 16 probability of getting that. Now you could solve that using a tri-hybrid cross and this nasty Punnett square that's eight by eight, but you're never gonna have time to do that on a test. And so make sure you, you know how to use and understand the idea of multiplication. How have we tweaked that? Well, two big things that we discovered was the idea of sex linkage, that some genes are actually found on the X chromosome. And as a result of that, you can't do a standard Punnett square. You have to have a Punnett square where we actually include the sex chromosomes. So this individual here would be a female who's a carrier for color blindness. This here would be a male. And so if we were to fill in the blank, this would be a carrier female, but this would be a male who has color blindness. This would be a regular female, and this would be a male who's regular as well. So this one would be afflicted by color blindness because males only have one X chromosome. Um, link genes is another important thing. We can't really do Punnett squares for them because you get these weird answers. In other words, we'll find frequency of crossover that's like 17. Uh, you couldn't do that with a Punnett square. So the moral of the story is that if two genes are linked, they're not going to cross over at a frequency of 50%. But if it's less than that, that means the genes are closer together. And so you can actually construct a gene map by looking at all their frequencies of crossover. Uh, example, the red hair and freckles are linked genes. They are on the same chromosome, and that's why we tend to see them together. Last thing then to tie it all together is to get more into the details and we'll spend more in the next unit on how we actually express these genes or not. Um, and that's using what's called the operon. So basically operons are used by bacteria. We don't use operons. Um, this would be the lac operon over here and this would be the trip operon over here. Um, that's TRP. Uh, down here would be how we actually express genes. This would be eukaryotic expression. So eukaryotic cells. Um, so let's go to the operon and look at the major parts of an operon. They're basically going to be the promoter. This is the region where that RNA polymerase can grab on and exp express those genes. We have an operator that works almost like an on-off switch. And then what bacteria do, it's really unique, is that they put all the genes required to do one task right next to each other. And so basically, if RNA polymerase runs down here and makes all these genes, you can make all those proteins do that one job. What's important with the lactose? Well, once lactose is present, you want to be able to break that down in bacteria. And so the way their design is pretty neat. What happens is, if lactose arrives, lactose will actually bind to the repressor. When it binds to the repressor, the pre repressor is gone. It'll actually move. It has a conformational change, doesn't fit there anymore. Now RNA polymerase can go down and make all these proteins. So if it's present, then it's on. If we look at this next one in the trip operon, we don't want to make tryptophan if we have it present. So in this one, when tryptophan's present, it actually binds to the repressor, and that's going to turn it in an off position. Now RNA polymerase can't race down here and make the protein. But let's say all of a sudden all the tryptophan is gone. None of it's going to bind to that repressor. Now it's gone. We're going to make all those proteins, and we're going to be able to synthesize tryptophan. Now we don't use operons. What we use are something called transcription factors, which is a series of proteins that are gonna bind to certain sites on the DNA and certain sites on the promoter and allow the attachment of RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase won't be able to express the gene until we have all the transcription factors in place and we have that DNA fold back on, on itself. And so it's a totally different mechanism for expressing genes, but it also explains why we have large areas of our DNA, DNA that we used to refer to as junk DNA. We now know that those are used in controlling gene expression. So that's a lot. We went all the way from DNA to gene expression. Um, so I hope you picked up on at least something and I hope that was helpful.